Welcome to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast with Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. During this program, you will hear interviews with real-life successful investors who will share their stories and provide useful advice on how to acquire, finance, and operate apartment complexes. Now, here they are, Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. Welcome to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Peebles, National Underwriter for Old Capital. And joining me today, as always, Mr. Michael Becker. Michael, how are you? Well, it's going. How's it going, Paul? It's going all right. You know, not everything is shut down these days. And so uh, we are just uh, staying in the, the quarantine house of Paul Peebles. So, you know, probably have not left the compound here for probably 14 days. So uh, I don't know what it's what it's like outside. I, I think I've seen that big bright sun in the sky, but uh, I haven't walked out to explore what it looks like around the neighborhood in 14 days. This is this is really unbelievable. This is a kind of an unprecedented times, and we're just trying to get through it. How's everything going for you, Michael? Uh, we're hunkered down, watching the world come to an end, having a couple of deals in escrow that are having some challenges to sell. So we uh, that and you know, kind of trying to figure out what's going on in the capital markets. It seems like the capital markets are, you know, generally speaking, temporarily frozen, with maybe the exception of Andy and Freddie, but those are still a little messy. And uh, that's kind of what we're going to talk about today with our with our guest. So on the podcast today, we have J.P. Cochran, and J.P. is with Pensford Financial Group, and we've had J.P. on. Oh, probably about nine months ago, 10 months ago, we were kind of talking about the, what the future of interest rates were going to be at that period of time. I think we've seen them uh, actually come down. And that's something we kind of want to figure out is just his perspective and try to figure out if there's any you know, little words of wisdom. JP's been in the business for a long period of time, and, and we're kind of reminisce about some of the times that as bankers in the past, what we had to go through. And how we, I don't know if we could certainly prepare for it, but some of the, you know, being in the moment of what we had to do at that period of time. So in the podcast today, I would like to welcome J.P. Conklin. J.P., thanks for being on. We appreciate that. Hey, good morning, guys. Thanks for having me. Hey, J.P. So uh, maybe uh, you were on six or so months ago, as Paul just mentioned. So maybe give everyone just a little brief background on yourself and your, your company, and then uh, and then we can maybe go from there. Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me again. And I own a company called Pensford that's primarily an interest rate derivative firm where we will advise our customers, almost exclusively commercial real estate customers, on things like swaps and caps, uh, defeasances, interest rate strategies, swaptions, things of that nature. So things have obviously been very volatile uh, over the last couple of months, in particular the last few weeks here, as I'm sure you guys are very aware. Yes, I think everyone on this podcast is listening by very aware. So, and it's for uh, a sake of uh, kind of reference points, we're recording this at 9.20 a.m. Central Time on March 26. So, uh, whatever JP is about to tell you might be different in 10 minutes from now. So, <laughs> that's kind of the volatile in the market. You know, as we're kind of just ramping up to have this call before we start recording, JP, you were kind of talking about how you're telling your team, you know, 12 years ago, you were with uh, Wachovia, which is which is no longer in existence. And you were kind of you know, reminiscing how, how this is kind of similar in some ways and different than others. Maybe uh, maybe that's kind of a good place to start. You know, what's kind of your experience been, you know, the last couple of weeks and how's that kind of been the same or, or what's been different from, you know, 12 years ago and kind of the last uh, financial crisis? I think it's really hard to describe to anyone who was not working during that crisis. And we probably have a lot of people who weren't because if they've entered the workforce in the last decade, they really don't really have a recollection for how it was, but everything stopped almost overnight. I can remember working with my CMBS counterpart who had something like 17 deals in the pipeline. This was probably June or July of 07, really before it had made the headlines um, a full year later. And we had the first subprime crisis and his 17 deals froze overnight. And during that period of time, while Kobe started backing up pricing, you guys may recall, CMBS was pricing at insane level, some sub swaps plus one IO for the full 10 years. And his client base, those 17 pipeline deals, he was attempting to get done, but he had to widen out dramatically. I think it was around swaps plus 400 bips. And a lot of clients were rightfully upset. 
I still remember being in the office with one of his clients who was the last one to get a deal done with Wachovia before CMBS totally shut off, who had was initially furious that they were retraded swaps plus 400. They were the last deal to get done, and they ultimately were grateful. They were like, we had no idea that it was going to cease to exist for the next couple of years. And so for anybody who didn't live through that, it's tough to really rationalize and wrap your brain around how we can go from being full steam ahead to everything stops immediately. But that's what feels similar between this time and last time, which is everything is stopping. If you didn't have a deal right at the finish line, it's probably getting pulled. You know, and I wrote in a newsletter a couple of weeks ago about MAC clauses, material adverse change clauses that banks would use in a scenario like this to get out of any sort of lending commitment. And we're starting to see more and more of that. So I suspect over the last week or two, guys like yourselves have experienced banks pulling back from what felt like a committed deal, and everyone is now scrambling just to see can it be salvaged or not. And I think we will continue to see that, and then a month from now, we will just simply see there are no new deals getting done. The only deals that are actually happening are going to be some sort of extension or maybe some Fannie and Freddie stuff. Aside from that, I think most of the, the main lenders are going to be out of that business, particularly if they rely on some sort of securitization, which has evaporated. So are you just saying the securitization market just is completely off? There is no way to get a CMBS loan out and securitized the debt funds. You know, we were talking briefly for the reason I was late for this call was we had a, I have a deal that's an escrow for 70 million to sell and the lender froze uh, two days prior to close. We're trying to scramble to figure a way to get that thing put back together. And that they were going to use a, a mortgage REIT was their lender. So it seems like the mortgage REITs, the debt funds are kind of off. What are you kind of seeing from like Lifeco, Fannie, CMBS? You know, who, who's actually going to have money? I mean, you said, I know you said maybe Fannie, Freddie might be able to make some loans, but uh, can those loans actually get securitized? I know the, uh, the MBS market was kind of you know messed up and the, the spreads just really gapped up earlier in the week. Yeah, so what I'm hearing is that I thought life codes would still be in the market, but because there's so much volatility in how, you know, triple B bonds are pricing the market, that they don't feel comfortable knowing where things should be pricing at. So they're sitting on the sideline right now. Your experience is not atypical. Anytime you're dealing with a debt fund that has to securitize its debt, it now has no ability to go out and securitize that and offload that risk. So what initially starts with this pricing exercise of I'm not sure how this will be received 45 days from now when it actually securitized is now there are no bond buyers for this securitization. And therefore, I can't offer anything because I'm essentially, if I give this loan to you, I'm holding this on balance sheet. I have to assume I'm holding it on balance sheet, which is not what they were built to do. So the only debt fund deals we're still seeing get done are those who don't necessarily finance themselves through securitization. So they may have like a warehouse line or a huge line of credit with somebody that's not necessarily going to be securitized. They're still able to offer loans. The challenge is they don't know where the pricing should be. So they are also pulling back dramatically. So I think it's kind of like everybody just putting their pencils down for now and saying, we're going to revisit this in a couple months. But for now, like we are not going to be in business until we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Wow. That's scary, Paul. Yeah. I mean, um, Michael, go back, you know, JP worked for a large bank, Wachovia. In fact, uh, they wound up. Uh, what, what did you have to do with Wachovia, Michael? Well, I just say we had a. Uh, I worked for a regional bank that they uh, Wells Fargo entered to buy about a month before they agreed to buy Wells Fargo, and they closed both our transactions the same day. So we both were uh, at Wells Fargo by force and not by choice. <laughs> about a year in 2008. So yeah, this kind of reminds me a lot of that. And in certain respects, but the other respects, I mean, it seems like the entire, obviously, the entire economy is shut down. And I saw today. A regional bank is a different, yeah, a regional bank is kind of a different from like a CMBS lender or something that has a, a securitization behind it because they can extend out the, the terms of the, the contract itself. And so what we're seeing on the Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac side is forbearance agreements. JP, are you familiar with the forbearance agreements right now these days? I mean, uh, you just don't do apartments, but you do other property types. What is kind of the, the information that you're hearing about people who don't have the capacity to actually make payments because there's just not enough income coming in or, or in the future, there won't be enough income coming in to make payments? 
everything that we're hearing from people is a concern almost over this vicious cycle. It's, it's one thing to say that we're going to forgive payments for the next couple months, which then in turn creates this moral hazard. If someone was going to pay, maybe they are not going to pay now because they figure there are no consequences. And we're entering a cycle here where we don't know when people are going to start paying again. And so a lot of brokers in particular who I've spoken with have said there's going to be a lot of attention on how rents and leases look after April 1. Is it that 80% get paid or is it that 50% get paid or is it something even worse? And obviously, the more that hold off on making those payments, the more severe this contraction is going to be. And so I think that what the government is trying to do right now is figure out a way to keep pushing money into the system in order to keep making payments. So whether that payment goes to a landlord or to payroll or other expenses, utilities, let's keep making these payments so not everything has to stop all at once, in particular since the government is really the catalyst for the shutdown. What's the take in terms of, terms of interest rates right now? I mean, we've lowered interest rates significantly, but uh, can we go into negative interest rates? And what type of an impact is that going to have on the economy? I think it would be foolish of me to say that it's impossible to have negative interest rates when most of the developed world has been dealing with negative interest rates for some time now. So I think we all need to wrap our brains around the possibility that we will have negative interest rates right now. This morning, we actually saw T-bills go negative. So there is certainly some possibility, might not be the base case, but there is some possibility that we will be dealing with negative interest rates here in the, the next six months. I think the more likely scenario is the Fed will continue to intervene aggressively to keep rates as close to zero as possible in the hopes of spurring lending and borrowing and investment. But right now, that's not what the issue is. The issue is the economy has ground to a halt. People can't spend their money even if they have any. What's the point of borrowing money if I have no ability to invest in something where I have paying tenants? So we're kind of stuck in this limbo where we need to get to the other side and start seeing when does this start spinning back up again, then we can start this whole cycle and have another recovery coming out of it. So we've seen some guidance come out about the forbearance with uh, Fannie and Freddie, and they're going to give it to borrowers on a case-by-case basis. And as so long as the other uh, borrowers, you know, one were not past due going into April and two, one of the big caveats is going to have to, of uh, hold off on evictions for the residents for the greater 90 days or until the loan gets out of forbearance. Don't get me on my soapbox. I think that's a, the craziest thing I've ever heard about having to loan out of forbearance before you can evict your residents because I don't see how you can ever renovate your rehab your rent roll with non paying residents to replace them with paying residents if you can't kick people out. But that's a whole other story. What do you expect on these securitized loans that aren't, aren't agency? So, like, you got your, your CMBS loans. Uh, both the multifamily and other asset classes. Um, you know, do we expect those lenders to forbear? How does that process work? You know, do they have uh, both of servicers and special servicers, and it's uh, not a cohesive uh, government agency like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are? I think that that market is going to take its cues from the federal government, because if the federal government can set things into motion that allow for some sort of forbearance without penalty then that market will not seize up. I think that's the risk right now. And so if they can somehow set into motion things such as, we aren't going to consider this to be a non-performing loan over the next three months, let's say, then the banks can react differently than they will currently. If the Federal Reserve says, we will buy these bonds from you, we will use these as collateral, then it will encourage people to sell those to the Fed who in turn will return with cash. Now you can go put that cash back into the market. So I think that there are mechanisms there in place. They're just unprecedented. So I have no idea what that will look like. But I think that the regulatory environment around any of these sort of forbearance agreements is going to be crucial because the guys like you shouldn't be punished because your tenants are being allowed to not pay for the next 90 days. If they're not going to be required to pay for the next 90 days, something has to happen with you guys too to have some sort of relief. That in turn 
has to give some relief to the lender. And it has to work its way through the system. And I think we're all going to be taking our cues from the federal government on how are they going to handle the regulatory aspects of this over the next sort of three to four months. And so we've uh, recently gone to a lot of adjustable rate mortgages with Freddie Mac, and, and we had a couple of LifeCo ones, and they've all been LIBOR-based. I mean, I know the, the whole push here before the world's coming to an end was to switch from LIBOR to, to SOFR, and I'm on your website right now, and I'm seeing SOFR is one basis point, and LIBOR is 94 basis points. Why the heck is LIBOR not at zero when the Fed funds cut to zero and SOFR is basically at zero? Yep, so let's start with SOFR. The reason SOFR as, is at effectively zero is because the Fed is pumping up to a trillion dollars a day into the repo market to ensure liquidity. And so they started this process back in September. You guys may recall when SOFR sort of spiked. It, the average reset for the day was five and a quarter, but there were actual some actual transactions north of 10%. That caused the Fed to start jumping in and providing what started with a $50 billion a day emergency repo. Repo just means that it's a loan between banks backed by treasuries. And so banks were very reluctant to lend to each other. Didn't matter what the collateral was. I don't want to give up my cash. We're seeing the same thing today prior to this trillion dollar a day injection into the repo facility where banks are just reluctant to lend cash. So go back to 2008, Wachovia, for example. Wachovia had a run on the bank. So not only were people draining deposits but large institutions that had lines of credit drew down all of those lines of credit because they were afraid Wachovia was going to go out of business. And then they wouldn't be able to have that $500 million line that they had sitting out there for the last couple of years untapped. So they drew down the $500 million line, deposited it with another bank, and that just exacerbated the run on the bank. The banks learned from those lessons. And this time around, they said, what are our unfunded commitments right now? How much could be drawn on our bank in the next five days? And so they were hoarding their cash knowing it was coming. There was a wave of demands coming on all that. So when it came to repo rates, banks were unwilling to lend cash to each other. And so what is the way that you incentivize someone to loan you money? You pay a higher interest rate. And so we saw that that interest rate kept creeping up higher and higher and higher. So the Fed intervened with trillion dollars a day directly into the repo market. That brought that down. They were basically out there saying, we will buy this from you, and we'll give you cash in exchange. The bank said, this is a great deal. I'll take it. So it's effectively 0% right now. Conversely, LIBOR is unsecured. There is no collateral behind it. So banks are hoarding their cash saying, I'm not willing to lend you any money. You have to incentivize me to lend you money. And right now, where that's getting cleared is 94 basis points. They're having to pay a premium relative to a cost of funds just to get someone to loan them the dollars because they know that wave is coming. Where do we see LIBOR going here in the next uh, you know, several months? I think that it will grind lower. I think that we are seeing a temporary blip as long as this $2 trillion stimulus package starts working its way through the economy and banks feel comfortable that they're not going to be held to really strict regulatory requirements, that we will see this to start loosen and it will start grinding lower. Where it should settle eventually is somewhere in the neighborhood of 25-ish, 30 basis points. It's not going to happen overnight. It will require liquidity coming back into the market, confidence, and then we'll see it start to move lower over time. Got it. Yeah. Can you tell me what Pensford does in relationship to the lenders and the lenders that you're working with? Are they still lending this week or next week? I mean, uh, you're kind of the front end of uh, kind of seeing deal flow about what's what's going on. Again, explain what the heck. Pensford does? Sure. So primarily, we work with borrowers for interest rate hedging needs. Usually, that is a swap, a cap, or some sort of defeasance. I would say that we have been very busy for the last month for two reasons. Number one is opportunistic hedging. When rates plunged, people who had been sitting on the sideline thought, you know what, let me come in. This is a good time for me to start hedging myself. Help me execute a swap with my lender. Help me buy a cap. The other reason that we were busy was because January was a really strong start to the year. And we typically see our volume tick up dramatically about 45 to 60 days after everything gets set into motion because we're very closely tied to the closing itself. I think going forward, what we will see is no new deals or very few new deals are being initiated today. And so I think we will see a sharp turn lower probably 45 to 60 days from now. 
May will probably be a very light month here volume-wise just because who's starting a new deal in this environment right this second? Probably no one. Because even if you have the capital, you're like, I don't know where this is going to shake out. I'm going to hold off. And lenders are certainly pulling back. So I, I would say what is keeping us busiest right now is probably the, the smaller regional banks who don't have the same requirements that the large banks have and who, you know, customers tend to find the money somehow. And so they're finding these regional banks who over the last couple of years have started doing swaps banks that none of us have heard of. Every day I talk to somebody who mentions a bank I've never heard of that's now doing swaps through a back-to-back -back program that they in turn have with the Wells Fargo's, the PNC's, the U.S. banks of the world. Can you explain exactly what a swap is? Because a lot of people are familiar with Fannie Mae and you know 10 or 12-year fixed rates, and some of them are familiar with the CMBS market of, say, 10-year fixed. But in these regional banks, which may be the up-and-comers, to try to do some of this commercial real estate, they may offer somebody a loan that's based on, say, a 10-year swap. Can you explain the benefits of doing a swap and some of the negatives of doing a swap and maybe just high level what the mechanics are? So, again, people who are not familiar with it can uh, just get some general information. Absolutely. So banks really got – into the business of offering swaps because they wanted to compete with the CMBS, the LifeCo, these long-term fixed rate lenders, but they wanted to do it on the balance sheet. They didn't want to have to securitize it and sell it off. They wanted more flexibility. And so swaps really offered banks initially the ability to compete against 10-year fixed, but also more dynamically manage their own interest rate exposure. So they would offer swaps to clients saying, I'm going to give you a floating rate loan LIBOR plus 2%, for example, and I will let you swap it back to a fixed rate through a separate instrument called a swap. That business really started to take off mid-1990s, and then we saw an explosion in the early 2000s because really any loans greater than about a million dollars were candidates for swaps. And so it gave banks the ability to, to say to clients, listen, we can compete with the life codes of the world and offer you more customization, and we can give you partial recourse, let's say. We can do a lot of things that maybe we couldn't otherwise do if I just tried to give you a traditional fixed rate loan. It also became a revenue generator. And so when I was at Wachovia, swap revenue was the second biggest revenue generator for the bank after only cash management. Because cash management is riskless, swaps has very low risk relative to basically every other product out there. So it became a revenue generator. And so banks started offering this and requiring clients, if you want to get a fixed rate from us on loans above a million dollars, you have to use a swap. I'll give you a LIBOR plus two loan. We then swap it back to fixed. You have a fixed rate for the next five to 10 years. And they work great as long as you know what you're getting into. And so banks have the ability to mark up the rate that they're offering you without disclosing it to you. And they end up making an additional revenue on that without having to really tell you about it. That changed with Dodd-Frank. Dad Frank said, hey, sorry, big banks, you now have to disclose that number to your clients so that they're at least aware of it. But Dodd-Frank does not require that as small regional banks. So small regional banks, and I would say, you know, we're talking probably $5 billion and under, they started offering swaps. They didn't want to set up their own swap desk, <laughs> so they would reach out to the big guys and say, can you help us? Can we outsource this to you? And so it gives them the ability to quote a client a fixed rate of, let's say, 3% in this environment. They do a back-to-back -back swap with the Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo can charge them a little bit of money. The regional bank can mark it up by you know, 25, 35 basis points, make a couple hundred grand of extra fee revenue, and the client locks in 3% and they're happy. But I think we're going to see a lot of dislocation in that market because these regional banks don't fully comprehend what they're offering to their clients. Everything has been fine the last couple of years while things were going well. And once we see a downturn, those nasty swap documents called ISDAs, ISDA agreements, banks will use as leverage against borrowers and, and force them to the table. So as long as things go smoothly, there's never hiccup. Once they don't go smoothly, those swap documents are frequently more onerous than the actual loan documents because guys like you focus on negotiating the loan docs and then commonly the swap docs are overlooked and banks have provisions in there that will protect them. Again, explain a little bit about I mean that is the stuff and how that can affect you. Let's say you know banks do don't want to make long term fixed rates. That that's just they take in short term deposits from grandma and your aunt Betty, 
but they don't want to make long-term rates. And that's where the swap comes in to be able to offer that type of stuff. But talk a little bit about ISDA and some of the things that uh, you could see as being potential. And is there any way to mitigate through that if interest rates either go higher or go lower? Sure. So regarding interest rates going higher or lower, I think what you're speaking about is the idea of this two-way make hole. Meaning if rates go down and you prepay, you'll owe a breakage cost similar to yield maintenance or defeasance. But if rates go up, a swap will actually pay you. That is going to be commonplace in all derivative contracts. You don't have to negotiate that separately in the ISDA. What the ISDA says, however, is there are all these provisions that you have to adhere to if you want this swap contract. And generally speaking, banks will say these are industry standard documents. They're boilerplate. They don't obligate you to anything. We just need you to sign it and send it back in in case you want to do a swap. But once things start to go sideways, those documents get pulled back out. And the most common one that bites people in a downturn, and I saw this a lot in 2010 and 11, is what at the, at the bank we refer to as backdoor cross default. So you will frequently negotiate cross default out. It's very common to close on a loan with a single asset entity, but that doesn't mean that the swap docs mirror that. And so if a bank can point to the swap docs and say, yeah, sure, just loan A is in default, and so its swap is in default, the swap document says all your other swaps with us are also in default. And so all those other swaps are in default, which in turn put their own loans into default as well. And so it's just something you want to pay attention to, because if things do go sideways for a long period of time, that could be used against a borrower. I think they just should be aware of that going into this contract. It sounds great. It's just a fixed rate. It works really well almost all the time. Just go into it with your eyes wide open. Got it. Michael? Anything else uh, you think we should know? Any any uh, bold predictions for the next uh, few months that, uh, that you're kind of expecting to see in the marketplace as we kind of wrap up the interview, JP? Yeah, from an interest rate standpoint, what I would say is that this stimulus package certainly suggests inflationary pressure, but that's not on the near-term horizon. And a month before all this happened, the Fed came out and said that they're willing to put a cap on Treasury yields during the next downturn. Now, we had no idea it was coming this soon, but they've already said that they'll put a cap on Treasury yields if they need to, if they think that's going to help the economy. So I would not be as worried about interest rates spiking as I would be worried about What does my refi scenario look like over the next six months? If I have a loan coming due or an extension coming up, I should start managing that proactively as much as possible now because that is far more relevant than my rate risk is going to be. Yeah, got it. How severe of a recession are you kind of modeling into your base case here? I mean, are we thinking thinking this is, you know, the next Great Depression, something like 12 years ago? How quick do you think we recover? What's kind of your, your base case right now? I don't think we'll have the next Great Depression, but I don't think it can be ruled out entirely either based on the the psychological reaction to the coronavirus. If that continues and we continue to see the shutdown, then I think that it could set into motion those sort of things. I think the base case is a dramatic contraction in quarter two. I personally am more pessimistic than most, so I think it'll bleed into quarter three. And then I think we slowly start coming out of this. I think there will be some sort of recovery by the end of the year. I'm less optimistic that it's a V-shaped recovery because I think this is unprecedented where an entire economy just grinded to a halt overnight. And all these shops who just laid off 3.28 million people last week, it's not just a, a switch that you can flip and everybody goes back to work. You know, These shops laid them off and I don't know that they're going to reopen. I think we're going to, we're going to have lingering effects from this unemployment that go well beyond the next couple of weeks, even if we lift the quarantine and everybody goes back to work. I'm not sure all these shops are going to open up immediately. Yeah. Paul, anything else? Nothing. I would just tell you, JP, we appreciate your time. If somebody wanted to get more information about what you guys do, what's the best way of getting hold of you or through your website? Yeah, go to our website, pensford.com. Also, you guys inspired me to start a podcast last time we talked. So we yeah. actually had our first one this past week. That's the rate guy. It's just me chatting about interest rates and markets, things of that nature. So I appreciate you guys giving me the inspiration for that. It took me a while to get it up and running, but it's it's finally there. Look at that. If you guys aren't uh, bored by Paul and my podcast, uh, you've got interest rate podcasts from JP. Look at that. That's great. <laughs> Good for you, JP. Is that on iTunes and Stitcher and all that, or where, where can you find yep, that? All, all those good things. Yep. Perfect. The rate guy. The rate guy. I love it. 
So, all right, JP, thanks for being on the podcast. We certainly do appreciate that. Some great information coming out. And uh, if you do want to get uh, more information on JP, you know, Pensford is the, is the group that uh, JP is with. So, Michael, thanks for uh, taking some time out of your busy day. I know that uh, you're getting back to the grind, trying to solve your problems and yep. make some opportunities out there. So we'll let you get back again. Thanks for being on the podcast, everybody. Again, I'm Paul Peebles. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast. Please join us at oldcapitalpodcast.com to sign up for our weekly email updates. We'll see you next week for another great interview.